Well, thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me and for the opportunity to talk, about, to talk about surgery and simulation. And I'm going to try and give you a, um, maybe some, some slightly unorthodox perspectives on what simulation might be. Um, and I'm going to start by, by looking at the, by, by, by framing the operating theatre as a place where more is going on than we tend to think. Because I think, certainly from my perspective as a surgeon, you go into the operating theatre, you do an operation, and you're thinking about the person you're operating on. But there's a whole load of other stuff going on at the same time. But you don't necessarily, um, you're not necessarily aware of it. So here we are with different, different perspectives. So over there on the right, of course, well, in the middle, the, 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 the primary surgeon with the best view. Um, those of you who spent time in the operating theatre will have sympathy, I'm sure, not only with his first assistant, but with his second assistant who has a very different view, or possibly no view at all. Um, we've got the scrub nurse, of course, we've got anaesthetists, many, many people, and many kinds of interaction, many kinds of choreography, if you like, um, between people on a larger scale and between, between hands, for example. So we've got very highly coordinated, intricate um, dances of, of hands working together for a common purpose um, in the operating theatre. Much easier to uh, take part in than to describe. Are you okay with the sound? Can everybody hear me? Yeah. So I'm going to look at this curious world of the operating theatre from several different perspectives. Um, as Linda said, I, I started, that's when I went to medical school, qualified in 1977, and for the first 10 years or so, uh, I was a surgeon myself, uh, did a lot of um, that time, five years of that time, in southern Africa and um, latterly Namibia. After that, as a GP, very different view. Still dealing, of course, with, with patients uh, who are undergoing surgery from time to time, but not, not doing it myself. Um, different sort of horizon of, of care. And now, uh, as an academic in a department of surgery, but as someone in the field of surgical education, I'm kind of neither one thing nor the other, in a sense, um, being a, not exactly an insider, not exactly an outsider. And so, again, a question of multiple perspectives overlapping. And things have changed a lot. So here's, here's my first perspective. That's me over there on the, on the left um, doing the kind of operation that was commonplace at the time. A lot of trauma, a lot of people who've been stabbed and shot. Um, and working, in this case, same time again, um, in, a, in a team, um, in fact, as the most senior member of a team in my mid to late 20s, doing really very big operations amongst a group of colleagues who were of the same sort of age. So trying to make sense of what was going on at the same time as learning it. Very different now, of course, in many ways, but, but in other ways not so very different. So although the view is very different in, in keyhole surgery, many of, of what's, many, many of the activities are not. And one thing that I think is particularly interesting is how you make sense of ambiguity, how you make sense of complexity. So, so this view is very different from that view of the inside of the body. This is the view that is kind of represented, that outsiders often think anatomy is like, where everything's clearly defined, where the arteries are red and, and all the rest of it. But actually, actually, when you are there yourself, you're dealing with a whole lot of stuff that hasn't got a name at all. You're dealing with stuff, you're dealing with things, with structures, some of which you have to get through and get out of the way to get to the bit that you want to get. Some of, some of it is vital, some of it's not important at all. And how do you make sense of that? How do you work out what is important and what isn't important? And so we've been doing some stuff looking at, some research looking at teaching and learning in the operating theatre from an ethnographic point of view, so working with social scientists to try and make sense of what is going on. And looking uh, at what happens when an experienced surgeon is teaching a less experienced surgeon to operate uh, laparoscopically is very interesting because instead of saying precisely what to do and what not to do, the experienced surgeons we've look, been looking at will say things like, they're, they're just watching and, and the, the, the um, experienced registrar will be doing. And then the senior surgeon will say, well, mm, um, I, guess, I guess the ureter must be around here somewhere or something, whereupon the um, surgeon who's doing the operation 
freezes and, um, and starts to be much more careful. And so we've got a different kind of dialogue, we've got a different kind of conversation going on according to what's happening at the time. Okay, so, so, so managing the unexpected, managing the uncertain, managing ambiguity is a crucial part of what we all do. And I'm going to show you a few clips of the kind of thing um, that I'm sure you, you get here and we get in London. Somebody who comes in having been beaten up. So, familiar to most of us. Um, rapidly evolving situation, lots of people involved, paramedics bringing somebody in, handing over information to a group of people who may or may not have worked together before, um, anaesthetists, surgeons, nurses, all sorts of people trying collectively to make sense of a rapidly changing situation. Dealing with a patient who in this case is clearly alive but not able to give a story, who's, who's unwell, who's got a stab wound uh, in the left upper quadrant, uh, and who's hemodynamically unstable. So here is somebody who clearly has got something wrong with them, but it's not known at the moment quite what that is. So this patient, of course, needs a laparotomy. And so if we, if we move on to, to when the team has started to open him up, again, conditions of uncertainty, not knowing exactly what they're going to find, but having to work collaboratively to work that out. So a group of surgeons over there in the foreground, anaesthetists in the background, um, pumping in blood, all the usual kind of stuff. And a rapidly evolving set of circumstances, which in the end turns into a, a manageable situation where it now becomes clear that there's bleeding, in this case from a uh, mesenteric artery, and so the surgical team is now bringing into play a different set of skills, manipulative, precise, um, procedural skills to, to get hold of that bleeding and, and fix it. So. So we're looking at a series of events, a series of things that build up to an operation and, and, and lead on from it. And in this talk, I want to suggest to you that we can look at surgery not so much as a science, although lots of people, I think, see themselves as scientists, but as a, as a profession, as a practice that is also uh, an art and a craft and a performance. And I'm going to look particularly at the performance aspects of surgery and how we might start to see those differently by looking outside the world of surgery at other worlds where performance is a central part of practice. So this procedure that I've just shown you, this laparotomy, was entirely simulated. Um, and it was taking place, interestingly, not in a simulation centre, but it was taking place at a science fair. It was taking place at the um, Cheltenham Science Festival about two years ago, where that operation is taking place in front of a group of, of um, 80, 90 people, some of whom we invited to come and take part. It was taking place in a marquee, out in amongst the flowers, in the, um, out, on the, just, just outside the town hall in Cheltenham. And after that operation had done, we then invited people to come along and have a go. And so here we are with some, um, some aspiring surgeons there who'd probably um, never felt a spleen, uh, never felt a liver, who knows, having a go and exploring an aspect of surgery that people don't normally see. This is something we did a couple of months ago um, along similar lines, but this time not in a science festival, this time in a park in Hackney. So we've turned up in the park with this um, minivan in the middle and a marquee in which we are presenting what happens, a sequence of events, what happens after somebody's been stabbed. A patient, played by an actor, comes in, dealt with by paramedics, real paramedics, real policemen. Then we go to the operation itself, where again, we invite people to come and take part. And then after that, we see the patient who has, after his anaesthetic, turns out that he needed a stoma. So here we are with somebody who has, um, who has been left with a whole lot of completely unexpected things which have, of course, major repercussions in what happens to him when he goes back to his community, what's happening with his mum, what's happening with um, everybody else around him. And um, having a very high level of engagement and involvement from people who would never come to the Science Museum, they would never come to the Cheltenham Science Festival, they would never come to a formal public engagement event. So we're starting, to, we're starting to blur some boundaries here. We're starting to look at what happens when you take something from the place you normally expect to find it, 
the operating theatre, to a place where it is commonly, where that sort of thing is commonly explored, like science fairs, to somewhere like this, it's completely different. So, I think what we, well, what I hope we're doing here is moving away from a traditional model of engaging with people, public engagement as it's called, which is, which is this sort of setup. I mean, I'm up here and I know loads and you're down there and you know hardly anything and I'm going to tell you and then you'll know, which I think is still um, very widespread. Moving from that to a totally different model, which says instead, OK, we all have our different perspectives. We all have different kinds of expertise. I have an expertise in what it is to operate, and, and lots of people here have more experience than I do in that, uh, other people less. But you've all got different experiences as well. You might have the expertise in what it is to be operated on, or have someone in the family who needs surgery, or whatever. And the model that seems to me to make much more sense is one of sharing those different expert perspectives, so that everybody learns something different from the process, rather than just transmitting information. So here's an example of another one. This was something we did a couple of months ago at the Big Bang Fair in uh, London this time. For those of you not aware of it, it's a big science fair, 60,000 people, children and young people, mostly over three days. And we're looking here at um, brain surgery. So we're looking at what happens when a patient needs uh, an emergency operation. And in the middle there, you can see uh, an operation taking place. So over here is um, uh, a, an ambulance where the patient has been, the patient played by an actor, had a head injury, has been resuscitated by the HEMS team, the emergency helicopter team. Uh, this man here is the head of neurotrauma at St Mary's, where I work. And we're, we're, joining, the, um, we're joining the story at a point where the operation is beginning and where a team of neurosurgeons is beginning to, um, to raise a flap. And so we're inviting people not only to have a look at that, but also to take part. And so here's somebody who you wouldn't normally expect to find on a neurosurgical team who is, um, who is kind of experiencing something that you don't normally experience when you're nine. Um, you possibly don't normally experience at, at, at all. And getting that sense, I think quite vividly, of not only what it looks like, but what it feels like to drill a hole in somebody's head. For those of you who are interested, we're going to be doing this very thing tomorrow and Saturday in, at the Manchester Science and Industry um, Museum, if anybody's interested in coming along. Um, and this is very interesting because this may seem completely uh, outside most people's experience, but... but the fact is that if you get run over by a bus or something and you've got a nasty head injury, or your child does, or your parent, or something, then pretty soon you're going to be on the operating table having this done to you. And I think it's a really interesting um, facet of engagement around things medical, is that although, that while you might or might not be interested in climate change or particle physics or whatever, and if you're not, you can kind of leave it on one side, you might or might not be interested in medical things. But if you're run over by a bus, or you get acute appendicitis, then either you get it fixed or you're dead. So it comes and gets you, even if you don't want to be interested in it. So there is that, that, that sort of um, richness of, of, of experience that people, people bring. Here's another one. Now this one's interesting too, because this was something we did at a, at a science festival a couple of months ago. And this one is um, exploring what happens when new technology might come into the operating theatre. So this rather uninspiring machine over there is a thing called the Intelligent Knife, which is a very sophisticated mass spectrometry device, which takes a, it's a, some research being developed at Imperial that takes what is normally an irritating waste product, namely the, the diathermy smoke, um, which gets up your nose and you don't like it. But it actually contains a huge amount of, of chemical information. And so this machine analyzes almost in real time, it takes 0.2 of a second, to get a spectroscopic analysis of that diathermy smoke and tell you whether you, what you're cutting through is normal or malignant, let us say. So here is a, a new approach that could have a profound effect on, on surgical practice, but it hasn't yet been tried out. And we all know that bringing in change into an inherently um, resistant 
social environment like the operating theatre is not easy. So using this as a way of testing out what happens when something entirely new is brought into uh, a familiar clinical setting. So we did that by involving people, inviting people to come and take part and explore some of those issues and then open that up for discussion about what, what might be going on. And I think this is an example of, of, of a, a possible model where surgery and science normally take place out of view. They take place in a completely separate universe from the experience of, of most publics. But if we can bring about a kind of connection between those two worlds, then I think there is a really interesting possibility of using this process of engagement to not only tell people stuff they didn't already know about interesting science and medicine, but to work in the other direction and to use that process as a way of challenging and testing out um, how science and how clinical practice are, are going on and, and bring about change. Okay. So simulation then offers, it offers a possibility of being a bridge between worlds. It's the clinical world um, and there are lots of people who are interested in that clinical world and, and in discussions about simulation, we tend, I think, to think about people who have access to that world, the people who are in there anyway, the learners, the teachers, the registrars, the teams, all the rest of it. But there are loads and loads of other people who are really, really interested in that world. But for them, they can't get in. All sorts of very good reasons. Don't want people just turning up off the street and um, having a go. But that means that lots of people who would be interested in the world of surgery, for example, can't get access. And so to me, simulation is a kind of, it's a kind of halfway house. It's a kind of a way by which we can bring into view those embodied practices that we saw with the little lad using a craniotome. And that in order to do that, we can use, we can let our imaginations go a bit. We can use unorthodox approaches to create a transcription a way of representing an originary world that is closed to people who would not have access to it. So the sort of standard approach is to try and replicate in every detail uh, what's in that originary world. So we look at simulation centres and there are, um, they're all over the country of course and the really um, big high octane ones are extremely accurate and they're made up of stuff that's exactly like the real thing or is exactly the real thing and that's great except that they're very expensive they're hard to get at and many people who would benefit from them can't get there so we've been exploring the idea of whether it's possible to have a different approach where instead of instead of replicating in every detail this sort of photographic view of the operating theater you could do something more like this where where you you get at the essence of what's going on without needing all the details now this is, this is um, anyone know who this is? Bye. This is Barbara Hepworth, who I'd thought of as a, as a sculptor entirely, but she did these extraordinary pictures in 1948 when she, um, her daughter had osteomyelitis and needed a lot of orthopaedic um, procedures. So Barbara Hepworth spent a long time in the operating theatre just watching and she, she created a series of 15 or 20 extraordinary pictures, hospital pictures, of which this is one. And I think the interesting thing here is that you're, you're, well to me, you get a very strong sense of people working together with a focus. They're calm, concentrated, you see their eyes, very expressive, even though you can't see their faces at all. But you don't see the patient, you don't see the operation, you've no idea of any of the details of what they're doing, but nonetheless it gives you a very clear sense that this is an operating theatre and surgical things are going on. Even in her drawings, no colour, um, same sort of thing. So we've been working with the idea of, of, of what I'm calling selective abstraction, of just taking from that originary world the minimum that you need to make people believe in it on the assumption that it's what they're doing that makes them think it's real, rather than all the detail around them. So we've been looking at two ways of doing that, of, of how to recreate settings for clinical care and how to recreate the people on, on whom we do it. So uh, I'm, I'm sure you have one here. Um, this is the, the sort of photographic transcription. Looks grainy because it's through one-way glass. Um, anaesthetic machine, operating lamp, um, I think this one was just under a million pounds. This is the, one of the ones in, in Paddington. And as I say, great if you can get it, but you usually can't. Um, so 
our idea a while ago was to create something that would do that function, but in a different way. So here is a, an enclosure, an inflatable um, enclosure, which actually takes about three minutes to put up. This is a rather speeded up version, but not very much. Um, and I originally saw this as a sort of, a sort of um, membrane, a, a boundary membrane, which you could use to do surgical things, and then you could close it so that wherever it was, it wouldn't, you wouldn't be distracted by what was on the outside. You could do it in a um, conference centre, you could do it in a sports hall or whatever. Um, and to do that, I've got a space which is kind of clinical colours with one or two things that are a bit like what you would find in theatre, but not very much so, really. I mean, operating lamps aren't on tripods, they're much bigger, they're all, 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 all the rest of it. But nonetheless, you've got that sense of something um, that's white and round and bright and it's overhead. And if it wasn't there, you'd think something was wrong. Same goes for the other equipment. This was an interesting one. This thing on the left, um, this picture of an anaesthetic machine. Our principle was to try and be as cheap and as lightweight as we possibly could. So we just tested out the idea of instead of having £75,000 worth of anaesthetic machine, whether we could in instead throw £80 um, at producing a digital photograph put onto a conference banner and see what happened. Uh, not expecting it to work. Um, so here's the... the, the um, operation I showed you earlier, same, same clip, um, and, sorry, it's the same clip, so, over there on the top right is exactly that banner, um, and the interesting thing to, to, to us, whoops, uh, was that not only um, people who didn't know the operating theatre, but we did validation studies with pretty experienced surgeons, you know, ST5, ST6, blah, 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 consultants, and 74% of them never noticed that that was um, not a real anaesthetic machine. Now, I mean, I should say that the, the anaesthetist would have noticed, I'm sure, quite quickly, but, um, but for, for it just shows that if your attention is focused on one thing, it's amazing what you don't see in the rest of your field if you're not expecting there to be anything out of the ordinary. And the surgeons, were, it had never occurred to them that the anaesthetic machine wouldn't be real, so they didn't think to question it. Um, and I think that's a really interesting idea, which of course people in theatre and dance have known for many thousands of years, but there hasn't been that cross-fertilisation between worlds that, would, that has really made the penny drop in the world of simulation, I don't think. So this idea of having something that you can then pack up and put in the back of a car and take it around to places um, has been very interesting, um, because it's allowed us to... To, to change things round and say, well, maybe instead of closing things off so that insiders can't see out, what would happen if we open things up so that outsiders could see in? And so instead of closing this inflatable, this igloo, this enclosure, instead of closing it off, we've been opening it up. And that's what you saw with the brain surgery at the, uh, at the Big Bang Fair, for example. Um, so a way of inviting people to watch and take part in things they wouldn't normally get at. Now, the other thing we wanted to do was to create a sense of, 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 of working with real patients who were really injured. Um, and for a long time I'd been very unhappy with, with this kind of approach to learning, well, let's say something simple like suturing, where these nurses are quite clearly not making the connection between these pieces of um, foam and real patients, because, you know, I'm sure it's the same for you, they, they drop them, they twiddle them around, they sort of, you know, rub them with their hanky if there are bits on them. They do all sorts of things that they couldn't possibly dream of if they were seeing this as a real patient. So a while ago I had the idea that maybe if you just simply aligned one of those with a, a member of the human race and covered up the gap, you might get something different. You might get something that was more like a clinical encounter and less like a technical exercise. And it turned out to be very powerful, even at a simple level like that. Since then, we've developed it, working with people from film and television prosthetics to create a series of, um, a series of models which are stuck onto um, healthy human people to make them look as if they've been injured or are ill, um, and done skillfully it's very hard to see the gap. Um, and so even though at one level you know that that's a stuck-on wound, at another level it's very hard not to treat somebody looking like that, not to respond to them as if they were somebody who'd come off their bike and might have had a nasty injury, or whatever it might happen to be. And so this idea of using theatrical 
skills to create um, a semblance of an injury which makes you respond clinically rather than in that hypercritical way that, that you think you would is very powerful. Um, and it never ceases to amaze me that whenever I see people like that, even though I sort of d designed them and invented these ideas myself, I still respond. If I, if I go up to somebody and, and put my hand on their leg and they go, oh, I, I spring back and say, I'm terribly sorry. You know, you just can't stop yourself doing it. Very, very curious. And that was what this wound that I showed you earlier was. So if you've got somebody like this and you palpate their tummy and, and they, they, you, you, know, you, you kind of um, get sucked into believing that it's real. So, so having said all that, I started wondering whether by looking outside surgery we could get different insights. We could see that world of surgery that's become very familiar in one way. See it through different eyes, see it as unfamiliar. So this is, I run a master's um, programme, a master's in education, in surgical education at Imperial, and this was an example of a session we did um, last year, I think, where these are the MED students, and the man over there on the left is a, is a lute maker, a very distinguished lute maker. And the idea here is to start looking at surgery as a craft, and surgery as a performance without making assumptions about the surgical side. So Stephen Gottlieb, for decades, has been making lutes. He has extraordinary levels of dexterity artistry, and he's operating at an intersection between materials, tools, hands, that in many ways are very like the intersection between materials, tools, and hands that are surgeons we deal with. And so here he's showing how he... Um, uses these materials to create a piece of work in progress that will eventually end up as one of these. But of course making it only one part of the story, the other part of the story is what you do with it when you've made it. So here is somebody, different kind of expertise, here's somebody who is a lutenist, um, and we're talking here um, to him in a session at the Cheltenham Music Festival about instruments, musical instruments, scientific, uh, surgical instruments. So somebody who's comfortable in the rarefied courtly atmosphere of John Dowland and Renaissance Baroque lute music, somebody who's played at proms, high-level performer, but somebody who also, in another part of his life, plays the lead guitar in a rock band, so is able to switch between genres, is able to switch between playing highly, highly um, thought-out pieces of um, of, of, in this case, quite old music, but at another time to improvise, to respond to the moment in different ways. And so we had a very interesting conversation about what are the parallels between um, scored musical performance, playing Dowland from, a, from notes, and an elective gastrectomy from improvisation in a, in a rock or jazz band and emergency surgery when somebody's been run over by a bus, for instance. And it turns out that there are, that there are closer parallels, and parallels that, than you might think, because playing from a piece of uh, written music, there's enormous scope for interpretation, for fluidity, for all kinds of different um, approaches, as indeed when you're doing an elective gastrectomy, everybody's anatomy is different, you have to respond to things in the moment. Um, jazz improvisation, it seems completely made up on, in the moment, but of course it's not. It, it relies very heavily on, on um, ways of doing things that people have developed over years of study, and they put them together in a particular sequence that may be unpredictable, but the, the components are highly predictable. As you open somebody up after they've been run over by a bus and you don't know what you're going to find, but when you find that you need to do a splenectomy, you know what steps to, to do. Very interesting. So I want to... Um, finish up by, by looking at another, another kind of simulation and another kind of performance. And this is a simulator that the 
design engineers who developed our inflatable operating theatre also came up with working with a colleague of mine at the Royal College of Music. And this is a, re this is a rehearsal um, performance simulator. The problem is in the um, colleges of music that the students there spend hours and hours, God knows how many hours, practising, but it's mostly on their own in, in practice rooms. And they get surprisingly, creepily little training in, in the process of going out onto a, a concert platform in front of an audience, sort of inhabiting the space and doing it. They get almost no training in that at all. So the idea was to create something that would, that would get at that. So this schematic shows a, a very simplified um, setup where, apart from the grand piano, there you've just got a, a, a sort of portioned off couple of, a couple of um, portable dividers to make a green room, you know, the place where you wait before, the, before you go out onto the stage. And then over here on the left, we've got a screen and we've got some bright lights shining at them like the ones um, on any stage. And so, as a performer, you stand behind the door, you wait until it's your turn to go out, and then you go out there. And when you go out there, this is what you see. Well, when you're in that green room, you see people coming in. And then when you go out there, you see an audience. Um, you see an audience who's waiting um, for you to start. Sometimes there are, there are dis distractions and things, as there often are with audiences. And then after you've, um, after you've played your, your, your piece, um, you hope that they will... Um, <laughs> if you've given a, a stellar performance... <laughs> you might get that. Or, or if not, then um, you, you might have a different outcome. Um, and, and, and although... Although this is a, a, a projection on a screen, again, like the, like the compound fracture, like the um, wound on the face, it's very hard not to respond to this audience, even although, at one level, you know that they're not real. There's another one that they've done as well, which is equally scary for musicians, which is this one, um, which is an audition panel. And um, you know what it's like with these panels, they, they, they don't say anything much, do they? And they, they give you the willies, at least I think they do. It's a bit like job interviews, isn't it? It's that sort of thing. Mm. Thank you, that was excellent. And that's what you hope they're going to say. Thank you for coming. <laughs> And so there's a whole lot of kind of how you interpret um, accurately or not these, um, these rather <coughs> obscure signals that you get. Um, and for the musicians, this is a really big problem because this is making the difference between whether they do or do not get into this orchestra or that orchestra or, or whatever. It's really important. It's like jobs for us, um, you know, at the, the next level in our career. But one of the interesting things about this is that is this, this reacting to something, even though it's not real. So I want you to just look. This is a member of the public at the Cheltenham Music Festival recently where we tried this out. She's, she's an amateur. She's, she's just, we're just getting to the end of her performance, and I want you to notice what happens when she leaves the room. So she knows perfectly well that that's not a real audience. But nonetheless, she can't stop herself acknowledging its applause. <laughs> so I wanted to finish by giving you a glimpse of, of a, a project we did recently. This is a programme on Radio 3 in February, I think, where I was working with um, a musician from the uh, Professor of Performance Science at the Royal College of, of Music to try and explore some of those ideas. And what we did was to, was to use two kinds of simulation, two groups of people. One was, um, was three surgical teams. 
um, each doing a carotid endarterectomy. The, the, the lead surgeon, who was a registrar in training, um, was asked to carry out a, a carotid endarterectomy on a simulation on a conscious patient. Um, so for, if anybody's not aware of this, this is, the, um, this is an operation for taking out gunk, obviously, in the carotid artery, but in order to recognise if there are neurological problems, frequently done under, under local anaesthetic. So the patient, the surgeon is not only dealing with the operation but having to be aware of how the patient is responding as well. Quite taxing. Um, in the simulated operating theatre uh, at St Mary's, this time the, the, the photographic one, the highly um, realistic transcription. And so the operation is being carried out here and it's being recorded, audio recorded with that big microphone, several microphones, to give a, a sort of ambient, ambisonic um, capture of what's going on, of the actual events of the operation. And then afterwards, the, the next day, each of these three surgeons went to the studio and listened to their performance, so to speak, and recorded, over, recorded then their responses, you know, their sort of inner voice, trying to capture what they were thinking at the time. That's the operation. And, and so here's, here's one of the surgeons um, doing that. And so she's talking to herself at the time or afterwards. So she's giving a kind of running commentary of what's going through her head and, and all the things she was thinking. And then we've got a series of, we've got three string quartets. This time we're looking at the cellist on each of them. Quartets of different levels of experience, rather like the surgeons. And again, we got each of them to, um, to get ready as they would do for a real performance and then go upstairs to the rehearsal simulator to go into it to, to inhabit the space and to perform their piece. And again, record their inner voice. And then the editor sort of put all these bits together and then, then Aaron and I sort of discussed some of the issues and the, uh, for, 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 for several hours afterwards and the editor very skillfully interwove those, those, those different strands into a half-hour programme. And that was very interesting for, for certainly for me and for Aaron, the, the musician, as, a, as a, uh, an opportunity to explore more systematically what our different worlds might have in common because you would think perhaps at first that there's really nothing in common between string quartet players and um, and people doing surgical operations, but actually, as soon as you get over the, the obvious differences, the similarities begin to emerge, and the more you look at them, the closer they are. So, I started by suggesting that surgery is not, a, is not an applied science. Surgery is a practice. It's a, it's a profession that is also a craft and a performance, and that by looking outside our normal frame, um, we can come to see differently a world that we thought we already knew. And that simulation offers a way of doing that. It offers a kind of a, a porthole, if you like, for other people to not only observe but to experience this world of surgery. It offers a common ground where people can come together and exchange experiences. And if imaginatively um, designed and used, I think it offers a, a huge range of possibilities that we tend not to think of when our focus is, 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 um, is the sort of traditional simulation centre approach where we tend to be constrained by how it's developed and what is currently done. I think if we, if we can break out of that and we can think um, more widely about what simulation as an idea might offer rather than what simulation as a practice currently does. I think there are enormous and very exciting opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Presentation of your work. Thank you very much. I'm sure all of the 
Well, I certainly hope so. I mean, I'm putting out some challenges, and now I'm hoping you'll take me up on them. Thank you. Uh, Professor Nemo, my question is about the use of flights, uh, something equivalent to flight simulator in surgical training. Uh, Ten years ago, when I went to New Orleans, it, is, it was being used very regularly there, and all the residents were supposed to go there on a regular basis. Uh, I wonder what actually is the validity of it is in surgical training in UK contacts, uh, cost being quite uh, prohibitively high uh, for most of the places. So I'm not sure if I've understood you. Are you are you saying the flight? Are you talking about flight simulators themselves, or are you using them as a parallel? Similar, similar to flight simulators. Surgical, surgical simulators. Surg yes. yes. I, I mean, I'm. Uh, ab absolutely, and I'm sure, I'm sure there is a lot of benefit from that sort of thing. I mean, I think there are... I think this parallel between aviation and surgery has been overplayed. And I think the, the, the primary characteristic of the aircraft is that it's, it's been designed by people, and it can be... and they're all pretty much the same, and, and the environment can be... If, if you can recreate the environment, then there's a, a, a relatively limited number of, of set procedures that you need to do in it. And I think the big difference is that there isn't that same variability that we get with every person being different. Uh, and also the, the, um, the practices of the cockpit are very formulaic, very um, clearly prescribed and very limited, whereas the practices of medicine are very frilly and messy and it's completely different everywhere you go and that kind of thing. So I think that sort of unpredictability and that fuzziness and that variety makes it very different, difficult to directly apply the aviation model to, to the health service, I think. I mean, I think there are obvious benefits in, in practising particular things that, that sometimes go wrong and you need, or, or seldom go wrong, but are really important if they do and everybody needs to know what happens if that's the case. And all the scenarios on, you know, I don't know, malignant hyperpyrexia or this failure or that failure are very good from that point of view. But I think the danger is if we see, if we allow ourselves to believe that that's the only use for simulation. And I think that it has much, much wider potential than that. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not really simulation, but it's the use of video feedback because you're using that as well. Aren't you? Yes. In, yes, like, absolutely. Doing yeah. And and how she reacts. Yeah. Um, have you done much? It is, so it's, not, it's a bit off. But have you done much with looking at videos of people while they're operating uh, to feedback on how they're interacting and also um, while they're actually operating to, so that other people can see in the, in the room and see what they're doing? Because at the moment, No, we, we've done quite a lot of that. We've done, done a lot of, um, and are still doing a lot of observational uh, work um, where we're using an ethnomethodological approach to try and make sense of what's going on in the operating theatre. I'm not quite sure if this is an answer to your question, but um, we've been... I don't know if you're familiar with this approach, but essentially you, you take... You, you, if, if you're there in the moment doing it, loads of stuff happens, it goes past, you can't remember it. If you take... Um, a tiny section of video, let's say 20 or 30 seconds, and you analyse it in great detail. And um, this particular branch of social science involves really great detail. It involves playing things, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times, playing them forwards, backwards, fast, slow, sound, no sound, all sorts of things. You start to see things that you were completely unaware of before. For example, you start to see that as people are... Um, are, are working in a team operating, there are a whole lot of tiny, tiny physical movements that are highly coordinated that um, come into play, that, that, that are people reading one another's bodies, in a sense, that's completely unconscious. So, you know, a surgeon is, is, is putting in some stitches in an artery or something, and then the assistant knows they're going to need scissors, they start to move forward, the scrub nurse is beginning to give them scissors, the surgeon does something else instead, everybody goes back to... You know, the, these tiny, tiny little movements. And so looking at, um, at the practices of the operating theatre from that different, points of view, point, different point of view shows things that were completely unexpected, shows forms of communication that people are unaware of. And I think being able to show people themselves doing things is very powerful because... As I say, in the moment, you, you never get the chance to see 
yourself from the outside. And I think one of the, one of the big advantages of video is it allows you to do that. But I think you have to prime people. You have to invite them to look at particular things. You have to, sh you have to uh, help them direct their attention where it's most useful, because otherwise just watching stuff happen may not be terribly useful. I think you need to have a, a focus for it. And I think getting a more fine-grained understanding of the kind of things that are going on can be really, really helpful. I mean, there'd be quite a lot of studies, but, but I think most of the studies around surgical simulation, particularly, or pathways of surgical care, they tend to focus on the procedural side. Um, and as we all know, there's, you know, that's only just one part of a much bigger picture in terms of surgical care. Um, and they do tend to, uh, to focus on, um, on the high-tech kind of side of things, the procedural ones do. Um, particularly the, the, the minimal access stuff. Um, I think what, what is often not there is, is the, the, um, the social relations and the, the team working, all that kind of stuff that is actually probably the, the, you know, as important if not more important than, than those practical procedural things. But that's very difficult to do. Um, so we've done some stuff recently in, in, in looking at uh, at the extent to which it's possible to model pathways of care that involve different stages. So, for example, somebody who, when we did somebody who, who collapses somewhere with a heart attack and is then scooped up by the paramedics and then taken to hospital and then has an angio and then goes and sees their GP a few weeks later. You know, these, these sections of a, of a, um, a pathway of care that, that you never normally see in one go because either you're in one bit, in, you're always in one bit and then you don't see any of the others. And so this idea of using simulation to, to model connections and handovers and transitions, I think, is very potentially very powerful and, and very much underexplored. And I think that's, got a, you know, that's likely to be much more effective than some of the more procedural things, as my personal view. Yeah. yeah. When you held uh, an educational event in your inflatable operating yes. system, how um, do you get the participants to, to evaluate that and uh, when, when do you get them to do that? Well, um, it's a big issue, isn't it, evaluation of what that means. Um, we, we try and make sense of what's going on by looking at it from different perspectives. So, so w w one of the measures we use is how many people come along and talk to us and how engaged they appear to be and all that kind of thing. Um, more recently, we've been looking much more, not just at numbers and people filling in small questionnaires, because I really have serious doubts about the value of people filling in, you know, like at scales about how much they enjoyed it, because they probably will um, say they enjoyed it, but so what? I mean, you'd expect them to. If, you, if you've got a whole load of people and you put on something like that and they didn't like it, well, there would seriously be something wrong, I think. So just because they say they like it doesn't really get you much further. Um, so what we've been doing much more is to using these engagement events as a trigger for having discussions with smaller groups, you know, maybe this size of group, 20, 30 people, about some of the issues that the, that the uh, simulations raised. For that, that one about the intelligent knife I was showing you, for instance, we had interesting discussions about what are the ethical issues that this might um, pose. You know, if it was you on the operating table and this machine was, would you want it used on you, given the current level of knowledge about a new technique that hasn't become mainstream? That sort of thing. And I think you get a much better sense of how people are engaged and what kind of discussions come out of that engagement by doing that sort of thing than you do with um, smiley faces and um, you know, four out of five on a on a questionnaire. That's my feeling. I'm a bit I'm a bit sceptical about the sort of normal measures of impact. I think they are highly highly misleading very often. And after all, they also just tell you how people felt when it's just happened. It doesn't tell you anything about what you really want to know, which is, you know, what happens later. I think. Yes. Yes. And at that stage, we felt that probably after, say, three months, mm. the teaching had virtually mm. 
away. Yeah. Have you done any research on that sort of side and improved, managed to improve the training on simulators or acute situations that are relatively rare? We haven't personally, but I know there is a lot of information, there's a lot of data about that. And I mean, quite clearly, from an educational point of view, if you don't use it, you lose it. No question about that. Whatever it is, it, 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 it evaporates extremely quickly if you don't re reinforce it, even if it's something that you know is really important or really interesting. Uh, and the, 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 I think the most powerful thing to me is that this is nothing to do with how interesting or engaging you found it at the time. It's just part of being a human being, is that you forget this stuff. So, but because you find it really interesting and it's important and you think you'll never forget it, you don't find out that you have until you need it and it's gone. So I think systems have to have um, reinforcement built into them. It's not my field particularly, I haven't been looking at that, but there is loads of information about, loads of data about that. And I, I'm, I should say I'm not in any sense decrying um, that use of simulation, I think it's critically important and it needs to be there. I'm just saying that that is only, that that's one part of, of a bigger picture, not that it's an unimportant part, it's, it's a crucially important part. But I've been sort of trying to open up some other parts as well as that, not instead of. <coughs> oh, see what I mean. The work seems to have highlighted um, different skills and characteristics required in the surgery. Mm. I think it's the surgical equivalent of a jazz musician or a chamber musician having to listen to everybody else while they're playing under pressure in front of an audience at a difficult time and it's very easy I think particularly when you're inexperienced to focus on your task on, the, on what you've learnt to do and lose your awareness of what's going on around you and I think to me that's something that you can only learn by doing it. And you can do it in the real world, you can do it in simulation, but you need, you, it's something that you need to set out to learn. And something that I think really distinguishes experienced people from inexperienced people is that ability to, to keep the bigger situation in view while still doing specific things. And I think that's the characteristic that is, to me, is the most important. Yeah. To How do you mean to? I mean, I think surgical simulate. If, if you're talking about simulating operations, I think it's difficult. It, it's difficult to do because the more experienced you are, the more you're going to notice if it isn't like it should be, really. I think, well, I mean, I know there are loads of anaesthetists here, but my, my sense of it is that you can recreate pretty effectively the sense of being an anaesthetic team doing stuff if you've got an anaesthetic machine or what looks like one doing the kinds of things that an anaesthetic machine does because most of your decision making and stuff is mediated through the machinery during a general anaesthetic let's say and I know there's much more to it than that and that's why it's been highly successful for many decades unless if you're a surgeon unless you've got real real giblets and things that really behave like human tissue does it doesn't seem realistic and I think that's been one of the reasons why there's such a long gap between the uptake by anaesthetists and anaesthetic teams and critical care and all that side of things and the surgeons because it's very very difficult to create something that really seems real for surgeons I think it's getting there but it's taking ages Well, I've, I've always, and I still do, only ever see it as an adjunct to clinical practice. I mean, there, there's no substitute for the, for the real thing. That's what you've just got to do it. But with opportunities for experiencing the real thing dwindling as much as they are, then, and for all sorts of other reasons, I think simulation has a critically important role to play, but we need to, keep, we need to see where it sits, and where it sits is as an adjunct and, and a way of, of, of providing different perspectives on clinical experience, not as a substitute for it. And I think there's a real mis I think it's a, it's a wrong track to think that, so, that you're going to be able to do everything you need to know and then suddenly stride out into the operating theatre and do something you've never done before because you've practised it on simulation. I, I think that's just wrong. But I do think it has an enormously important role in terms of, um, of experiencing things that you wouldn't 
um, experience and building up your awareness and particularly your the insight into your own behaviors under difficult situations that you couldn't get otherwise because that can be much more sort of deliberately chosen and, and designed. Less time than, than they used to to actually see the real thing, and I think that's why a lot of people that advocate simulations. Yeah. That's one of the pushes. You know, that's right. Yeah. Because you won't see as much in your lifetime. Yes. Uh, uh, no, I'm, I'm not saying that simulation can't help you learn stuff that's useful when you're operating. Of course it can, and that's the point. But I'm saying that there's a mistake in thinking that that it is uh, that, that you can do it instead of. You know that it, there's going to come a time when you don't need to, to, to learn on actual patients through, through, through experiencing it for real. You can do it all in simulation, and I think that's 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 my argument really. Yeah, I just that up, I think it's actually quite an important point. The audience is actually a very selected audience hmm. with respect to simulation. We have an expert here, real experts in the world of as well. For the real, I think both of us have probably heard in the last 10 or 11 years through MMC and everything else, and the political intervention in the world of simulation, is there was a genuine belief driven by the profession, surgeons and anesthetists, at government level 10 years ago, which said we can because of the world of work time, because we have to train people faster, that it could be done through simulation. There was a there was a genuine drive which was both nationally politically and mm. professionally politically driven. And it was daft. And I think it, 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 it completely and utterly uh, daft. I, I think that that's where that's where the confusion with the yeah, aviation yeah, came in yeah, because people said, you know, of course, if you can, if you can, you know, you can train to a level where the first time you ever fly this aeroplane for real is when you, you, you know, because uh, th th why can't we do that in surgery? But, but, and uh, it but doesn't. Simple, and if you listen to airline pilots who train in those simulators, and, and the government can be completely seduced into believing that it's real. If you listen to the true pilots, like the one who, who landed the plane in. Chesley Sullenberger. I mean, yeah. uh, various people would say, actually, the simulator is quite useful and because I'm in the same place. But actually, you don't get the adrenaline rush of when the plane is about to crash. And actually, that's a flight when they are the transports of the auto when they're doing it. You, know, you don't get that in simulation. Now, I don't think simulation should aspire to. Well, I think, you, I think you can in aviation, actually. They do say it's highly realistic. But what my point is that aviation is not a parallel. Mm -hmm to surgery. Uh, it's, it's a different world and I think we have to be very careful about drawing these, drawing these parallels because it's, they're based on false premises is my, my point really. I'm going to bring up one topic which you wouldn't expect me not to talk about really. You, is that you mentioned art, yes. uh, science and performance and I wouldn't have any disagreement with those things. But you didn't say much about the art or even actually the thinking processes of surgeons while they're operating. And I think you've alluded to yeah. it, and you've, yeah. been, you've been implicit in actually one of the things that is so important is actually got what's going on inside your mm. head whilst you're operating. It isn't a matter of just being able mm. to put a stitch in that bleeding mesoteric mm. artery mm. or the other thing. And it's how you explore that alongside. There's a bit of talking. Do you do any writing with your trainee environment stuff? I haven't done. No. Although it's, it's an... It's obviously a very interesting one. I mean, that's, in a sense, that's what we're trying to get at with, with that radio programme I was talking about, where we got people to, to listen, to relive their experience and, and give a commentary on what had been going through their head at the time. And that was very interesting because we got loads and loads of, of, um, of, of um, opportunities, really, for people to, to do something they never normally get to do, which is not only to revisit something they've done, which is unusual in itself, but invited to reflect upon that by... by giving a different kind of talk because it's a day later from the one they would have had at the time. And I think that's kind of what you were yes, talking about, it isn't is. it? And actually I think it's the next bit of what, yes. where this needs to go, particularly in the light of developing surgeons. I think it's surgeons. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I don't believe in doing some of the insinuation will turn out the being mm. surgeon that I think I am and there are others in this room as well. Uh, it is something that actually you have to use a simulation to inform your practice rather than actually to take it as I mean, I, th I think one of the things that, that is not talked about much in the simulation literature is the affective component, you know, the, the emotional, you know, what goes on inside you when you suddenly realise you cut something you shouldn't have done or something. And the effect that has 
on your judgment um, and what happens next. And, you know, we, we, we have this kind of working assumption that we're all of us operating in an unemotional, evidence-driven kind of systematic way that allows us to make the best possible choice um, in a given situation. But actually, when something bad like that goes, happens, then all sorts of things go awry. Uh, to, uh, well, certainly in my case, you know, I'm sure it's the same for all of us, you, you know, you get a very strong... Uh, all sorts of other stuff happening that gets in the way of what the books might like to tell you is going to unfold and it doesn't and I think acknowledging that is quite difficult for, for people to do but it's really important because unless we do acknowledge it it's not surprising that things don't pan out the way we kind of predict yes, does, does that make sense to everybody or not it's called reflective practice actually um, I, I think combined Got another question here. It is an area absolutely right for exploration, hacking onto mm. some of this. Mm. Perhaps we'll go with some of those ways mm. to discuss it more. There was one more question. Sorry, it's um, just linking in from, from your answer to surgery. Um, the way of acquiring skills and answers obviously persists in deliberate practice. Um, and can you, or have you used your simulations to not only emphasize the participants, but the deliberate part of the practice? So your, the actual reflection of Yes, we've done some of that. I mean, showing that things improve outcome is a really naughty one, isn't it? Because it depends what you mean by outcome and it depends what you mean by showing that you've achieved it and all that. Um, I, I do think that, um, that one, of the, one of the particular advantages of simulation, if you can recreate some kind of condition, some kind of setting or something, you can then manipulate it. You can, you can explore what if you did it differently, what if... X happened, what if Y happened, and you could do that repeatedly, and you can, you can watch yourself doing it. And I think those are two things that don't happen in real life, because in real life it really is a performance. It starts, you do it, it finishes, that's it. You can't go back, you can't redo it, you, you very often can't remember in detail what happened anyway, and even if you do, you're seeing it from an insider's perspective, and only from one point of view. I think simulation, if skillfully done, can address a lot of those things. And it can give you a different view of your own performance, which, if again, if skillfully done, can help you build up and and um, and develop a whole range of things that you need to to do. But it needs to be. Um, I think you need to be clear what you're trying to do, because there's a danger of being swamped by huge possibilities, and you need to focus on particular things uh, for particular reasons. I think. Well, I hope so. And yeah. uh, thank you very much for doing that. Pleasure. And uh, thank you very much again for making the trip to the Good luck tomorrow. Thank you.